I would see so many familiar faces, but if we haven't met, my name is Halima Sakrani. I am the research lead at the Housing and Communities Research Group and have been for about three years since um, Professor David Mullins retired. Um, however, as you can see from David's role today as chair, that we I haven't let him go very far and he's still very uh, much active um, in the group. Um, and of course, continue with his research work um, and ad advocacy as well. Um, so thank you to David, not, not just chairing today, but also um, I have to thank David for um, largely putting together this seminar series um, program, um, as well as my colleague Stuart Smith as well. And we're really, I think we're really excited about the lineup we have, the kind of quality and variety of speakers, um, starting today with Dr. Matt Thompson, um, who's going to be talking about um, his doctoral research um, that's published now in a book. Um, on lessons from Liverpool, exploring the potential of non-state collective alternatives to public housing. So I won't preempt David's introduction to the series or indeed the, in his introduction to Matt. However, I will just uh, reiterate a very warm welcome to uh, Matt and to say thank you very much for being our inaugural presenter. I'm very much looking forward to the session today. Uh, before I hand over to David, just a couple of things on the Zoom logistics of the program. Uh, David just will do a sh short introduction, then hand over to Matt, who will be presenting for around 40 minutes. Because it's quite a short program, we'll go straight into Q&As. Um, so please feel free to uh, make good use of the chat box. And just as and when you have some thoughts, questions, reflections, pop them into the chat box. Uh, David will scroll through those first and then raise those with Matt. And hopefully that's going to um, generate some um, engaging and sort of lively discussion. Uh, protocol for that lively set discussion. Um, if you can just click on the little yellow Zoom hand, um, as is the Zoom norm, uh, and David will come to you. And if you haven't got a little yellow hand, then just pick up your hand or do a dance or wave around. Or we'll, 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 Matt will sort of catch um, catch you, and then David will ask you to contribute. Um, if you aren't contributing at, that, at any point during the um, seminar session, please do keep. Uh, microphones on mute just to avoid the usual background noise or any interference. Um, yeah, so I think that's all from me for now. And I'm going to hand over to David and just hope you all have a really enjoyable session. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Halima. That's great. And uh, good to see everyone here this morning. Um, this is um, beginning, really beginning of a, a seminar series, which we think will sort of last um, probably most of this year. We've got a number of speakers who have uh, accepted. Um, what we want to focus on is where next for public housing, and we think this is the right right time to be looking at this question. Obviously, in terms of building back better after uh, after COVID, but also uh, we're still really at the very early phases of uh, reacting to Grenfell and the, uh, the the white paper, the charters, etc. Those those kind of issues are going to be featuring quite strongly um, during the series. Um, I was interested that in the response to Grenfell, the um, uh, government started talking about um, what the role of housing might be in terms of um, providing safety, security, dignity, an opportunity to put down roots, and almost a bit of a feeling of a return to some of the things that um, were being talked about at various points in the 20th century about why it will be a good thing for uh, government to invest in housing and people in housing need to be um, supported by uh, by government to uh, to meet their to meet their housing needs feels a bit different to the flavour of the preceding uh, 20 or 30 years where we seem to have moved away from uh, a lot of those uh, a lot of those things. Uh, the take that we had from the um, housing and communities research group in Birmingham on these issues is quite broad. And so when we're using the term public housing, we're thinking about uh, state engagement with meeting housing needs, but we're not necess necessarily thinking about any particular um, organizational or institutional uh, form. So for example, we have a strong interest in participative models within uh, what's currently called social housing. Um, we have a long-standing interest in co-ops and what's, what's currently called uh, community-led housing. 
But equally, we're interested in other work areas where the state is spending quite a lot of public money and perhaps having different kinds of outcomes in terms of meeting uh, housing needs of some of the most vulnerable. So thinking about the private rented sector, um, a particular interest from our research group in the uh, so-called exempt accommodation sector um, in Birmingham. So we want the, the series to reach really all of the parts of responding to housing needs, but involve uh, government and thinking about uh, how how, what are the opportunities to actually relook and take a fresh look and uh, do these things better? We have quite a strong geographical focus on the West Midlands for obvious reasons, but we also, because of the strengths of our current research group, we're also particularly interested in Northern Ireland. So we've got a couple of events uh, in the series which we'll be focusing um, on Northern Ireland, but we're interested, of course, in learning from everywhere. And so the uh, interests are very interesting in relation to Liverpool today. And at the next seminar, we've got a focus on, on London and the sort of privatisation, the state regeneration agenda, engenders uh, that Paul Watt has recently uh, written his, his book about. So um, there is, uh, in the chat box, there's a link to um, the flyer about the uh, series, so I don't have to say too much more now, but I'm just thinking we, we set out some questions that we hope we'll have um, be closer to answers to by, by kind of December from this uh, work. Um, the ones that I think may be particularly important today would be about how to restore uh, social values uh, of public housing, thinking about what's the relationship between um, public value inputs and social value outcomes. Um, how do we balance the interest of residents and communities with other stakeholders who've tended to dominate in terms of the direction that public housing has taken, particularly in relation to financial drivers of the system? Um, how, how might uh, charters be used to promote empowerment? Because obviously in a way the, the white paper has come up with, with charters as a model uh, to address some of the historic uh, uh, problems of public housing. How, how will charters work? And will they work in all areas that we're calling public housing or do they work better uh, in some uh, areas than others? Uh, mutuality and what are, the, what are the possibilities of mutuality and moving towards more democratic models of public housing? And what can we do about the new public housing in the private rented sector? So we've got, um, as you'll see from the flyer, we've got some uh, excellent uh, speakers already signed up and we've got uh, some approaches that we've made for further people in the series. But today, um, really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Matt Thompson, um, early, early career fellow at Liverpool University. Matt's been focusing on a researching cooperative alternatives for social economy and urban regeneration, amongst other things. I was really pleased when he agreed to, to kick off the series, firstly, because He's the author of my favourite housing book of the last couple of years. Uh, and secondly, because that book actually relates, I think, directly to the question, where next for public housing, or at least I hope it does. Um, looking on from my sort of um, early stage retirement, uh, I'm just really impressed uh, by Matt's energy and focus. And I suppose he would be more energetic and more focused than, than I am. But uh, I think um, it, really a model of what academic research practice on housing should be. He's taken his PhD interest on, continued to participate uh, with um, some of the uh, uh, groups who he worked with on the PhD, um, home baked in particular in Liverpool, and continued to, to hone the um, ideas. I think the book provides um, uh, both uh, a really strongly researched history of the three areas, e eras uh, in Liverpool. And if you look at the, uh, the acknowledgement section at the beginning, it's uh, almost like a cast list of, of people from different, uh, different periods there. And there's a great chance for some of the old lags here to, um, to wallow in, in nostalgia about that, 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 uh, that era or one of, at least one of those three uh, eras. Um, but more importantly for me, and I think for the series, is that the book is um, strong on the application of these ideas to framing future uh, policy. In the 1970s, there was talk of a public housing 2.0 um, never, quite took, never quite took off. Uh, but what would happen if public housing was founded on a, a democratic route rather than a state pater paternalist uh, route? Uh, state paternalism in, in, in social housing, as we've seen, is so, has been so easy to undermine by a coercive state and an invasive market. But what if public housing really belonged to the residents? Would it be more resilient? Would this enable the commons to be protected? Might we be talking about our public housing in the way that we talk about our national health service? Um, part five of Matt's book, I think, um, brings some really uh, useful um, nuggets that deserve attention by policymakers and activists today. 
So he talks about um, toward moving towards a system of provision found refounded on cooperative practices and collective ownership. He talks about the need to reinvent tools of local of the local and the central state in tandem with cooperative ag advocates and innovators operating at the national level. And then intriguingly, and I think it's borrowed from a, another academic Hein, who talks about, he talks about the need for activists and enablers to speak three languages. The first language uh, is, to, um, is an inward language to mobilize the ideas and actions within the groups. The second is an upwards language to talk, uh, to secure political support, uh, legal legitimacy and financial resources. And the third language uh, is outward so that the people of the wider public actually knows about this because I guess one of the criticisms of uh, a lot of things that have been going on is who, who really knows about uh, community-led uh, housing and, and, and is it seen as an alternative um, to, uh, to uh, existing uh, um, uh, failed, failed systems. So I hope that the seminar today will whet your appetite to get the book um, and for those of you working in public housing to start to make connections to see or continue with your connections to see what uh, alternatives might emerge. Um, Matt is going to speak for about 40 minutes um, and then we'll have half an hour or so for questions and as Helena said really to try and make the most of that time it'd be great if you wanted to jot down uh, short uh, questions uh, as, 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 we, uh, as we go through and we'll try and have a really good selection and discussion um, at the end. So welcome Matt, sorry if I've gone on for too long uh, but uh, delighted to have you here, thank you. Thanks, David. That very kind, very kind introduction there, and um, you know, no pressure. You set the bar fairly high there. <laughs> um, can you all hear me? Okay. Brilliant. Great. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks to Halima and David as well, really, for the invitation. It's it's great to be here, and uh, and thanks to you all for turning up on this sunny, very sunny day here in London. Um, so I'm going to just, as as David said, I'm going to just share a little bit of an overview of the book's main um, argument, I suppose, and findings. But in this kind of, I'll share my screen. In this, in this kind of framing around public housing and the renewal of public housing from a, from a democratic perspective, um, which is, as David said, is, is what the book is. It's what the book is, is basically about, really. So it's quite it neat. It fits quite neatly. Um, so the title is basically Liverpool's hidden history of collective alternatives, and I've chosen that that um, that phrase quite intentionally, collective alternatives. So I want to just talk a little bit about what I mean by that, I suppose, before I before I kick off with the, with the kind of historical overview of what's happened in Liverpool. So collective housing alternatives, I guess we can think of them a bit like community-led housing generally and collaborative housing. And I'll talk a bit about what the differences there are with those terms later. But these are basically alternative models for owning and managing affordable housing, but other assets as well that aren't public nor private. Something more to do with the commons, which I guess a lot of you will be familiar with. You can, you can think of these kind of different examples. There are different kind of legal articulations of these kind of alternatives. And what I'm trying to argue in the book is they act to do three, they all act roughly speaking to do three things to varying degrees. They enhance dweller control and user autonomy um, amongst those residents themselves involved. They decommodify land, which is quite a big, quite, I think quite an important point. And they capture the value of that land to reinvest locally. And that's kind of their sort of utopian potential, I guess. And they're, they're governed democratically, which I think is embedded in the idea of user autonomy as well. And for me, these help resolve some of the key problems that capitalist urbanization has thrown up over the last 100, 200, 300 years, right? But particularly the return of, of the housing question, as, as Engels would have called it, um, and the likes of Stuart Hodgkinson writing today, has recently, recently called it. Um, and other, so the housing question is suddenly being rediscovered among a lot of critical scholars, geographers, uh, political scientists, et cetera. And, um, and, and for good reason, you know, we're now living in an age where Housing has been commodified or being recommodified to such a, a huge degree that people have been excluded, and this is a planetary, you know, it's a planetary issue. Um, but in the UK, we see it quite viscerally, really, with the rise of generation rent, um, uh, you know, and and, and in, in insane levels of of, of asset bubble inflation, um, not just in London, but moving across the country, and the contradictions that in, entail uh, entailed with that. So. The housing question, I guess, in a, in a nutshell, is the kind of artificial scarcity that's sort of created by 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 different kind of structural um, forces associated with capitalism, and the deprivations, alienations, exclusions that that, that stem from that, uh, and and if you like, the geographical um, manifestations of some of that. So uneven urban development is a big 
big issue here where capital flees from an area and leaves it in uh, in severe in severe kind of dereliction if you like which is what happened in liverpool in the late 20th century so in this in this theoretical framing i'm basically trying to suggest that collective housing alternatives like community land trusts and housing cooperatives which are the main focus of the book so that's what happened in liverpool in the, in in the main um these things are, on, are, are institutional articulations of, of the commons. So the commons is obviously a, an idea that's been rediscovered alongside the housing question, if you like. Uh, it goes back, you know, so it's an ancient idea. It's the idea of the, you know, the, the rights of, of the commoners bef before enclosure and, and that, you know, as the, the start of capital um, gaining ascendance in the industrial period and, and commoners being forced from the land into, into burgeoning cities. But it's being rediscovered in, in a kind of urban setting. So the new urban enclosures are, are talked about and, and uh, new forms of commoning are, are talked about. And the way that I see that co-ops and community land trusts are working to resolve some of these issues of, of the housing question is through these three aspects here, which are kind of the three, three features of, um, of the commons. So a shared resource pool that's decommodified and helps resolve exploitation, a public sphere of deliberation and cooperation, which help, helps resolve alienation, and collective rights claims over place, which is which, and displacement is a big issue here. So often state-led, which I'll talk about a bit later. But that's not the whole story. And I think uh, there's been, especially when I was doing my PhD in Manchester, the, in, in a geography department, a very radical geography department. So excuse all, all this terminology it is it is it is wrapped up in Marxist Marxist jargon. But at the time, you know, in the late nineties and, and noughties, people people like myself and those involved in those sort of um, geographical kind of studies got really quite in really quite obsessed with commons as a kind of alternative to the way that um society was was headed and they ignored the state the state sort of started, lost its kind of kind of appeal i guess and it was being criti criticized for various different reasons but my, the argument in the book i'm trying to make is that we need to bring the state back in to this debate um that public housing is important not just community-led housing or, or common housing and the reason the reasons why I think um, um, can be found in the likes of Karl Polanyi's um, theor theoretical kind of understanding of society. So he sees different economic modes uh, that the state, the market, and civil society have, and the different operating according to different logics. And his theory of the double movement, where the marketization of of society, the disembedding of the economy from society, has has in response a counter movement by the state and by civil society so we see the state you know in in the in, in the post-war period the state really with a vengeance sort of tried to protect people's livelihoods from this disembedding effort through through, through public housing um that ha that suffered various different um various different fates but we now see also the resurgence of civil society action so the argument i'm making in the book is that these two things can be brought together in a kind of combination in a kind of dual a dual approach so the, the, the redistributive powers of the state should be brought into in, in combination with the reciprocity and the solidarity embedded in the commons and cooperativism and that's the way we can start to see public common partnerships or, pu or public cooperative kind of practices um, going forward and so you know part of this as well is about seeing housing co-ops and community land trusts within this broader um this broader kind of economy right so alongside trying to decommodify the fictitious commodities so as, as co-ops and clts do for land worker-owned co-ops do for labor credit unions do for capital and so on and, and i think we should see it in this in this in this kind of more systemic way so this brings me to why why i define it why i define these things as collective housing alternatives rather than say collaborative housing which is a which is a, it, it, collaborative housing is a is a kind of an emerging field on the continent among housing scholars that's really sort of gained traction in the last decade and community-led housing has even longer traditions i guess in in, in the british context anglo-american as well and both of these different approaches I, uh, I i think don't quite capture what what the potential is of 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 housing alternatives so collaborative housing i focuses in my opinion too much on participation and collaboration with stakeholders so it overlooks the management and ownership of land and assets. So it, it could include, for instance, only occupied co-housing, which doesn't quite capture the capture the, the commons. Community-led housing is perhaps a bit too inward looking. It sees the community can be quite parochial, right, as the agent of, of, of development and management. And so it kind of backs away from the public, you know, the idea of the, the wider public and, and accessibility and connection with democratic accountability. 
hence why collective housing alternatives is is is, is seen as is meant to be seen as this sort of um, this alternative to these two different terminologies, trying to gesture at this idea of a non-state public or, or a public common partnership or a public cooperative nexus. Some, some other scholars recently, friends of mine, have, 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 have started to theorise in very similar ways to this book independently. I mean, there's people coming to these same kind of conclusions. Um, so this is a public common partnership model, which I won't dwell on, but it just sort of gives you a flavour of what could happen around the idea of, um, for instance, a community land trust operating today with a cooperative um, that leases land off it in combination with the local authority or and with other, other kind of um, third sector agencies. But before, but that, so that's the kind of theoretical background, I guess. And so now I'm going to try and whiz through in the sort of 25, 20 minutes that I've got left. How that's how those kind of theories have played played out in Liverpool's history, um, partic with particular with particular emphasis on um, the cooperative movement in the 1970s, which I think is probably the most, as David mentioned, it's probably you know the, the sort of fullest articulation that we've seen of this stuff. Um, public sector housing 2.0 was a road that was 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 um, started, but it wasn't quite travelled down, unfortunately, for due, for due to various reasons. So, with this history, I, I take as inspiration the likes of Johnston Birchall, who's you know who's written on the hidden history of cooperative housing. Obviously, Colin Ward has written much more broadly about housing's hidden history, going back to the cotters and squatters and so on. So, I'm taking these as kind of departure points, I guess, to do a similar sign, kind of thing for Liverpool, quite specifically since the 1960s. And in, in this, so this is the structure of the book. So these are the kind, these are the different kind of initiatives that I've I've looked at. Um, the long 1970s here, so don't read that too literally. The long 1970s was the kind of was the first part of the book was was the housing cooperative movement, and I relate that to the housing question through an engagement with Engels and Proudhon and the kind of you know the, 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 the that, that age old debate of the landlord tenant relation is not the same uh, as the uh, capital labour relation, and I sort of try to dis I try to sort of unpack that a little bit through this through this movement. And then I sort of I suggest that the housing question mutates and evolves through the 1980s and becomes what I call the neighbourhood question, drawing on some, some work around social innovation. And the Aldonians, which are quite famous, Community Development Trust, um, have responded to that to that particular question, which is where capital flees when you have we have, we, we have decline across an entire neighbourhood, not just housing itself, or across an entire city. So Liverpool suffered a fate along these lines. And in in these in in this shift, you see the uh, the articulation, the legal articulation, the organisational form of collective housing alternatives changing as well. So there's different from a co-op to a community development trust. They have they have they obviously have different kind of different functions and ways of dealing with these different issues. And then fast forward to the 2000s, you have we have the neighbour the you have the urban question. Sorry, and the urban question is perhaps a bit broader and it's related to the the financialisation of land and housing. And community land trusts. Um, seem to be the vehicle that, that's being um, used in this in this present moment and that for various different reasons to do with you know legal institutional and political changes since the 1980s and you can see in some of these here that there have some been some failed attempts that I do touch on them on the book as well which are fascinating you know that there were these different CLTs that were started and didn't quite work uh, for various different reasons which I, I might yeah, have time to touch on so let's go back to the beginning. So we've got um, in the 1970s, you have what many have called Liverpool's New Build Cooperative Revolution, or Liverpool's Co-op Spring. You know, this is kind of like so this kind of radical revolutionary um, sort of ways of framing this. It's quite quite intriguing. And, and, and what do they mean by this? I guess well, so according to Kath Catherine Meredith, who was chief exec of the of the main cooperative development agency at the time, she claims that the that this this movement has has no major innovate represents a major innovation which has no comparable phenomenon in Western Europe. It, it claims, but you can see basically here that there's the, the co-ops that emerged in this period spread out right across the, the city of Liverpool and into neighbouring Nosley as well. So it's, it became a kind of city regional um, movement. Here here's the different waves of development. So you have a first wave which centred on rehabilitation, so terraces that were, were that were falling into dereliction and disrepair. The council. Liverpool City Council, the Corpy, um, decided to pursue a slightly different um, model based on, for various reasons, often to do with legislation at the, at the national level, opening up the opportunity for housing associations and later housing cooperatives to start, re start rehabilitating rather than demolishing and rebuilding um, inner city terraces. That then spawned a new build, um, new build wave, which was really much more radical, I think, in that it enabled 
well are controlled um, through design to, to occur. And then different ways later on that's, that spread through different parts of the city. So this second wave is what I'm going to focus on. So the second wave was a model that was, this new build model was really, um, really pushed by Cooperative Development Services, CDS, the kind of mother agency, if you like, that established daughter, daughter co-ops um, following the 1974 Housing Act, which you know, through various different cooperative um, advocates at national level, Howard Campbell, for instance, legislating for co-ops to be included in that, it, it enabled a huge amount of public money to be, to be um, made available for, for this, kind of, this kind of housing development. CDS worked particularly, beginning at least, with a, with a, with, with a group called the Weller Street residents who, who, who were in a slum clearance zone. So, you know, the, the council's slum clearance policy of the 60s and 70s was still in operation, um, and they were going to be displaced and moved elsewhere and potentially broken up as a community and they and they so their interest was that they wanted to be kept together and but they still wanted better housing they did what they wanted the housing demolished and rebuilt and that the, the, the co-ops that eventually came through this process were quite were, were quite interesting in that they they were a break with 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 the cooperative movement perhaps of the of, of the past so anyone from this area was entitled to join it well the people aren't necessarily being selected or self-selecting on, on on notions of cooperability so we're starting to move toward this idea of, of a public, more open accessibility toward, toward cooperatives. And they're fully mutual. So yeah, nominal, nominal pound would give you an equal right, a voting share. Um, and the Weller, the Weller Way was, was the model that eventually sort of kick-started this, this new build cooperative revolution. And this was a thing that was pioneered by the Weller Street and, and CDS working together. And so it, it, it would go, it'd go according to these, these, these seven stages, if you like. The residents were self-organised into co-ops, very much supported technical through technical support, um, legal advice, and so on. Professional, professional support from the likes of CDS, a secondary organisation or a mother agency, um, to basically identify a site, acquire land, and get the funding from the housing corporation, which had been opened up through the 1974 Housing Act, and then work very closely with residents on education and training, which would be often a very mutual process where they each would learn a lot from the other. And eventually start interviewing architects, agencies, and contractors who then help develop that scheme and put it through to the to completion. This was really quite radical in that it turned on its head the, the professional relationships that, that these particularly these working class communities had, had never really engaged in before in, in many ways. They were suddenly in the driving seat, they suddenly determined how things were getting built, how you know how who they were going to hire. Um, very, very interesting stuff. And the, co the, the, the architect would work very, very closely with 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 the residents, the designers team that they really that they that they wanted according to their needs. But the interesting thing, I guess, for this this for this for this seminar is that um, this was very much you know integrated into the council's housing allocations policy. So fifty percent were fifty percent of, of, of allocations were, were nominated by the local authority. Potentially, there was often negotiations because a lot of these co-ops wanted to you know ensure that there were enough places for their own for their own community. And the final design reflects doesn't just reflect local needs but it reflects the regulations determined by the housing corporation so that they would pay fair rent these are these are ex-council tenants they're going to be effectively in council housing that's cooperatively owned and run and they'll be paying the same fair rents as other council tenants so for that to happen they, they have to meet certain regulations so there's constraints here as well as opportunities and, and you see the, the coming together of these two different logics of redistribution and, and reciprocity as I say, it kind of it was a radical design process where um, you know the Weller, the Weller Street's motto was "You hold the pen and we'll tell you what to draw." To the architects, the architects are merely the scribes, and this is the kind of thing. This is what they built. So it, it doesn't look necessarily that impressive today, but it's kind of a strikingly elegant design, right? And they, they've described it as a kind of totalitarian and utilitarian mix, or a uh, Merseyprothism, if you like, a utilitarianism, which is basically this idea of um, this idea that when the Weller Street were um, Incredibly socialist-minded, uh, and there was a kind of there was a strong leadership through the, the management committees, and which was, in, if you like, quite totalitarian. And it was quite utilitarian, utilitarian in its design, also, right? Because it was about the basics. So you know, if someone got above their station, wanted an avocado bar, this being the uh, 1970s, they were they were shouted down by the committee. For instance, that was a kind of that was, a, that was a, one interesting um, vignette that was that was that was relayed to me by by Bill Halsall, the architect of the scheme. 
And the likes of, so some an interesting anarchist figures were involved in this, in this movement as well. So the likes of Colin Ward, the anarchist planner, um, has said, you know, the proudest moment of his housing advocacy was when the Weller Street chairman, Billy Floyd, introduced him at a meeting, waving a copy of, 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 of Colin Ward's book, Tenants Take Over, saying, here's the man who wrote the Old Testament, but we, we, we built the New Jerusalem. This is kind of fascinating stuff. So Colin Ward's, Colin Ward's um, theory, or if you like, manifesto for dweller control, collective dweller control, was, was first articulated in that book, Tenants Take Over, and it, 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 it informed some of the thinking of, of the Weller Street in particular. And John F. C. Turner, the, the, the barefoot architect or the anarchist architect who, who, who influenced Ward in, in, quite, in, in quite direct ways, who'd come back from, from South America having witnessed auto construction, self-build um, settlements in Peru and had his ideas around user autonomy um, very much influenced this, this movement at the time. So this is the idea that if dwellers control the process by which the housing is built, uh, design, construction, management and then ongoing maintenance, the housing will be cheap, it says on the front cover here, it'll be cheaper than those built through government programs or large corporations, but not just that, it will, be, it will lead to greater benefits. It will have more benefits for the environment and for those who are in, in, that, in that position of, of, of dweller control. And what do we see? We, well, we do see, these, we do see these kind of theories playing out, I guess, or these, these kind of claims, these anarchist theorists playing out over time. So, the, the, so many of the courts that were built have stood the test of time better than the surrounding housing in Liverpool. And they won awards, you know, they, they won different awards in planning and, and, and architectural streams at, at, at the time, even though they were derided by some critics as being incredibly ordinary suburban designs, but they reflected the needs of the local community. Well, they, 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 they're still standing today and, they, and, they're, and they're in much better shape than, than, than many, of the, the, many of the surrounding estates. So let me just, let me just um, summarize some of the key points of this system. So, John F. C. Turner would often call the system that he was describing a third system of, of, of production of housing. So not just housing, not just private corporations, not just state agencies, some kind of third system where the state is involved as an, as, as an enabler rather than as a provider. And this is kind of really what happened with public sector housing 2.0 in, in Liverpool during this time. So, this, so huge state funding, state interest as well, with, with nomination, nomination rights, and a massive secondary support infrastructure for training and development for the so CDS, but also Merseyside Improved Housing, another uh, CDS's competitor, MIH. They would both compete for this work and they would be incredibly dedicated to, to some of this stuff. So they're ideologically driven as well. Some of the workers involved in these organizations were committed to cooperative values. Um, so this is a fascinating kind of um, interplay between professionalism and kind of political kind of um, will from the likes of the communities. And as I say, there's this kind of healthy competition between agencies for this, for, for access to this state, to the state funded process. So you had HAG, so you had 110% of capital costs funded by the, um, by the state, 10%, that 10% was for admin costs. So CBS, for instance, would claim much of that to, to, to fund their, their costs, which, which were, you know, which were high because they were, they were leading, they were really working directly with communities from the beginning to the end in a very intensive way. Um, Architects as well work for free and at risk often, some for up to two years without any fees. They were committed to this idea. They, you know, community architecture, as it was derided by the architectural press at the time, um, it, it, had its, it had its principles and it had its, it had its advocates who were working um, really um, at their own risk often through this, through this period. So the hidden costs here are, are, are obvious, I guess. There's a lot of time consuming voluntary work, unsociable hours. Many, fat, you know, many families and marriages in, 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 in the, in the co-ops themselves were put under strain and broke up because of the huge amount of um, involvement and intensity of the whole process. But at the same time, you've got massive individual empowerment. Um, many of these, many of these um, individuals in, working in campaigning in this space, they've often been excluded from labor markets. Perhaps they were, um, they've been un unemployed by the, by the dock work, which was disappearing at that time. They found new skills, new jobs, but so sometimes they actually catapulted them into politics. So there's many there's stories of councillors coming from these these um, coming from these, these 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 campaigns. And in the long run, as I say, lower maintenance costs and developing community confidence, sense of ownership, etc. So there's some interesting benefits here that, that perhaps um, we don't see necessarily in council housing. And perhaps this is where Colin Ward's critique of council housing, for, for instance, as being kind of paternalist um, can start to be can start to see a shift in, in some of that. 
So you've got, so at the time there were a lot of, there was a lot of kind of claims being made. So you've got the Paul Lusk at the top here saying that um, this is going to be, this public sector housing 2.0 paradigm is going to be a major, possibly dominant form of public housing in the 20th century. And the Weller Streets would have been the model for that. The big claims here, and uh, I mean, I guess at the time it was, people were very, um, they were full of sort of um, positivity and ambition. And it was, it, was, it was quite an exciting period, but it didn't work out that way. And I, and for various different reasons, which I'll, which I'll just touch upon quickly here. Uh, it never did become the dominant paradigm of public housing. So we saw, firstly, we see a sort of dilution of, of the co-op revolution, if you like. So later, this is partly to do with the inherent tension within the model, right? So cooperability, the, the communities involved aren't necessarily selecting themselves or each other on the basis of cooperability. This is housing that is often being offered to, to them by professionals or by the state, or they hear about it through the, through the grapevine, so-and-so's set up a co-op to get better housing. They're about to be kicked out of theirs to be, uh, or their tenements, for instance, to be uh, displaced by the council. But there's this other route where they can get housing. So later on, many of the communities involved were, were doing it for different reasons. Perhaps the Weller Street initially did it for less politically motivated and much more pragmatically, opportunistically motivated, which is no bad thing. And that's the, that's, 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 that was inevitable, right? If we're gonna mainstream this, if this is gonna become um, a bigger thing than just a bunch of vanguard, um, radicals it's inevitably going to come up against that so but unfortunately it did it did change the nature of the way in which these co-ops operated so you often get critics deriding some of the some of the results as being incredibly ordinary um ordinary schemes and in many ways this set the this set the tone for the mass house builders of the 1980s um this was, it, it, these, these 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 schemes were designed by people it's what people wanted mass house builders in in, in, in some senses imitated some of these some of these initial kind of pioneering participatory design outcomes and you had this kind of these these kind of problems where because we're dealing in a situation where the economy is tanked um it's quite a hostile environment in the 1970s and 80s liverpool in many in many respects for many of these communities they turn their backs on the on on the surroundings um so in terms of urban design principles and the idea of public um public housing that that has you know principles of permeability and access, accessibility and so on they really did come up against those 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 um those limits so you often have you often hear stories of planners in in kind of conflict with some of the the, the co-op um members and the and the architects who wanted to design schemes like this with like wagon trains stopped for the night in the in the wild west turning their backs literally in the city and of course you had sectarianism happening at the in in, in this period as well still in liverpool and situations like this where you've got two co-ops one catholic one protestant with the dividing line down the middle um very different designs on each. But the thing that really killed it was, well, the thing that really stalled it, at least, these co-ops still exist, but they not no further ones were developed really after this period, was the militant, was the militant-led um, Labour administration that came into power in 1983 on the back of um, popular um, popular demands really for, for, um, for council housing, which had been neglected by the Liberal um, Council in the previous period. The Liberal, the Liberal Council in the previous period had put money into, into co-ops and private housing, and the Labour Party, particularly on the left, the Trotskyists and the militants, saw this as a threat to municipal housing and to, and to the principles of socialism, and argued that co-ops were an elitist conspiracy, nepotistic, um, and a way for basically the, the right and for um, the Liberals to basically um, you know, ring the death knell for for, for, for socialist um, public housing. And so they municipalized, you can see this map here, there were six co-ops that were in development when they came to power, they municipalized those six co-ops and put a stop to, to all that all further. So the movement, if you like, it, it flew the nest to Knowsley, to neighboring Knowsley with a different labor administration and actually and flourished there for, for through the 1980s. The Adonians, we, I mean, many of you will be familiar with this story. The Adonians were, um, a cooperative group, if you like, in that initial phase, um, campaigning for a co-op, but were, were threatened by municipalization, and they fought an, an incredibly extraordinary, an extraordinary battle, really, where they they brought Thatcher and Michael Heseltine into, into 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 play, really, to defend their rights against the militant local council. So some intriguing kind of um, some strange bedfellows, I guess, as I, as I put it in the book, where you've got a kind of socialist, Labour voting um, community who are allied ordinarily with the Labour, local Labour Party, um, actually being supported by a neoliberal conservative government 
because the Conservative government wants to win political points against the local council. And but out of that, they managed to secure funding for the village, for the Adonian village, which remediated a hell of a lot of industrial land that had been contaminated. And it's now, you know, it won, it's won UN Habitat Awards for sustainability. It's a community development trust rather than a cooperative. They shed a lot of the cooperative ethos early on. But they never really had that. In, it's a good example of, 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 a, of a campaign that never really had the kind of cooperative instincts at the beginning, I guess, so much. Um, they were doing it just to get housing and control of their environment, uh, and, the, and a development trust was the way to, to do that. Um, and there's, there's unfortunately, because of the lack of democracy within, I mean, I would argue that lack, there is a lack of democracy within the, the village. It is larger than most co-ops will start, might larger than other schemes, but there's a, there's a tight, there's, you know, there's a very, very strong leadership from the top. And recently there have been charges of all sorts that happening within, so for instance, the development trust has, has sort of folded. Um, many community enterprises that they've established have recently come under pressure and disbanded. So there's questions over uh, the, the future sustainability of the Adonians, even though it's done a hell of a lot of good for that area and continues to play a big role as an anchor for, for regeneration in that, in that space. But it's a good example of where, um, I guess, there's been mission drift to an extent. Right, so let me, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm coming close to the end of my 40 minutes. So let's see if I can wrap up. Okay, I'm gonna quickly touch on the fact that over the, over the next few decades, um, neighborhoods went into further decline in Liverpool for economic reasons. Um, and, the, and the council lobbied for government funding from the from, from central government to basically fund this huge um, program of regeneration called housing market renewal. It's a very complicated regeneration policy, which I try to do, try to go into a lot of depth in the book. But for now, in the five minutes I've got, I will just brush over it. But it, it was very controversial at the time. So residents in places like Granby and Homebaked in the inner city areas, which had been particularly Granby and Toxteth, had been the sites of the co-op the co ops a, a decade or two earlier. Many co-ops are still there, but some of the housing that isn't cooperatively owned or, or, or privately owned in that space was was um put you know was was set for demolition and rebuild and you see this kind of suburban housing being put, put in place of terraces lots of people were removed from their properties as this sign here nicely puts it uh, everything of value has been removed from this from this property it was quite yeah it, it was a, there was a lot of controversy around it people fought back but one of the one of the one of the big points i want to make here i guess is that Many of the housing associations that um, that were involved in housing market renewal as partners, key partners in, in what I call a grant regime with the council. So there's, there's services to be made by redeveloping this housing. So all partners in, in, in play here, and there's private developers as well, right? But these housing associations had morphed over the last few decades out of their original, um, their origins as cooperative development agencies in many respects. So plus Dane housing at this point I think just before this point, in fact, was home to CDS. CDS became part of Plus Dane until it eventually then um, spun back out um, as Northwest Housing Services today. Riverside is the heir to Merseyside Improved Housing, which developed um, the Ardonians, for instance. And Liverpool Housing Trust as well was a, was a key player in the, in the early days of those, 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 those rehab and um, new build co-ops. It's, it's now been embroiled in this new, this new kind of um, you know, this new form of comprehensive redevelopment. And in many respects, these huge organizations, and they're, 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 all, they're morphing still today, right? So LHT, for instance, is now part of Onward Homes, massive regional um, firm. The, many, Riverside, for instance, has like close to 100,000, I think it's growing, I can't remember how last my checks, about 100,000 properties. And that was kind of the figure that was, that was, that was bandied about, about, the, about the Liverpool Corporation, you know, about the City Council. The City Council was criticised for having too many properties and not having enough and neglecting a lot of the tenants in it, the scale of the, of the project partly, 90,000 properties. Well, Riverside has that many now as well, right? So they do arguably a better job managing their properties, but all that, that kind of connection to, to dweller control or to, to engagement of residents is long gone. So there's a question here over how, I guess, bureaucratisation, uh, and co-optation, according to different logics, um, has start, starts to kind of degenerate the cooperative movement over time. That's just a nice bit of scouse wit there, right? Um, thanking the, the the main players for housing market renewal and the, the dereliction by design that has resulted. So your housing group is a big was a big player in Anfield. Here's some resistance from from in Granby from local residents. 
And this, these, these kind of, this kind of resistance ended up um, informing the community land trusts that we see today in, in, that are quite famous. I'm hoping many of you know, know about these because I, I haven't got time to touch upon them. Granby Four Streets Community Land Trust here, for instance, guerrilla gardening going on, street market, um, assemble the architects came, came along and helped um, design some of this stuff, co-design along the same kind of principles as the Weller Street Municipal Design. And they won, the, they won the Turner Prize, the Art Award for, for their work there in 2015. Home Bank, who I've been involved with a fair bit in the last five years or so, doing similar stuff about high, high street regeneration through participatory techniques, um, turning the top, re the, top, the top floor of that terrace, for instance, into cooperative housing, the bottom floor into community enterprise. And this is the interesting thing about these community land trusts is that they are, they're, no long, they're not in the same category, I guess, as co-ops. They're on a different kind of plane. They're stewards of, of, of land in a way that, that co-ops can't be, I guess. So co-ops are owned by their members equally, and they are very much in the domain of ownership. Community land trusts start to move toward this idea of stewardship. They're kind of it, they, this idea of a trust, of trustity, uh, trusteeship. So they're stewards of land. And the buildings on which, the buildings, on, the buildings that sit on that land can be then leased to, um, to individuals or to groups. They can work with co-ops. As in the case of home banks, you have cooperative groups working with the CRT. The, the, the bakery, for instance, home baked bakery at the far end there, is um, is a is a is a co-op, and it's the tenant. It's a tenant of the CRT. This leads to some interesting relationships and some inter interesting governance potentials here around public common partnerships. The board, for instance, of the CRT is a tripartite board, very much like a public common partnership structure I showed at the beginning, where you have where you have a, a third of the members, a third of the board. Could, could be elected from the membership, from residents, a third from the wider community, and a third from, um, say, for instance, public agencies who have an interest in this stuff. So the council could, could, can be involved in this as a conduit here for, for opening it up to, to, to wider democratic accountability that I think co-ops don't necessarily have unless they federate in certain ways. Right, I haven't got time to, to cover this. This is basically the idea that CLTs were initially pursued, tentative, tentatively kind of experimented with as, as potential alternatives within a housing market renewal um, pathfinder. And it didn't, it didn't work for various reasons. But it was a kind of lost opportunity where in Liverpool there was the opportunity here for Arena Housing to set up a CLT. So a housing association that had been involved in housing market renewal actually experimenting with the idea of a community land trust didn't work out in the end because I don't think they got the buy-in from residents. So right, in summary then, so in the book, I'm trying to really go from this idea of reactive to proactive development. So all the community land trust um, schemes that I mentioned there at the end were really born out of um, reacting to threat. They were really trying to defend their right to place from um, state-led demolition, regentrification, you know, regeneration and so on. In a similar way that the Weller Streets were reacting to a threat, you know, their displacement and breaking up of the communities. How do we move, I guess, what I'm trying to get at here in, in the book is how do we move from this reactive, this focus on reaction towards a more proactive kind of um, systematic replication, scaling up of, of these things through institutional mechanisms. And the state is important here. I identify a number of recipes for, for revolution as home-baked put it. So key ingredients that, are, that need to be present, I guess, for this kind of thing to work. And again, it sort of, it just points to some of the, sort of, Lots of lots of things needing to be to be there at the same time. Um, very contextual, very conditional. Um, but what do you do when you don't have some of this stuff? You know, what do you do when you don't have place-based traditions of radicalism or dedicated professional support infrastructure? How do we build this stuff from from, from the ground? So I come to these this this three. I think David alluded to this at the beginning. There's this 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 three kind of um, three-pronged approach, I, I, I suppose. So we need to build an institutional infrastructure within the movement. So the co-op movement had had this at one point. CDS, Weller Street, and a few of the other Vanguard co-ops helped set up the Merseyside, or well, initially the Liverpool Federation of Housing Co-ops, then became the Merseyside Federation of Housing Co-ops. That died a death with the movement to an extent, but how do we replicate that stuff today? How do we build an institutional infrastructure, a federal, a federal, a confederated institutional infrastructure of co-ops that can start to cooperate amongst each other? We've lost, we've lost that a little bit. To support that, how do we re-engineer the local and national state to create, say, the supportive legal codes and policies that would help help that process move forward? Um, how do we get beyond this binary of pu the public-private tenant landlord that's written into um, you know, it's written into the, the legal framework that we work with? And I guess you know what I'm trying to do with the book as well is to craft a persuasive narrative. So I think the art of translation of storytelling, 
David alluded to that earlier with this, this, this kind of this three languages approach we're trying to work. How do we how do we how do we gain how do we gain the interest and um, support of wider publics, but also potential members, you know, within the communities, and also the funders and the legislators and the gatekeepers of, of support. And it's it's quite a can be quite a kind of difficult, tricky act of translation across those different domains of communication. But it's a real that's I think for the for the movement to to, to push forward, that's kind of what we need to do. Um, but we have some in interesting recent developments. So the likes of Breaking Ground has been established in the last year, which is a community-led housing hub for the city region, funded by Power to Change, the, um, the government agency um, for community business. And this is really uniting the cooperative and the CRT uh, movements for the first time, really. And it's doing it on a Liverpool city re region-wide basis. So the, the festival was the, there was a launch festival back in February, which really touched on many of these these questions that. I think I'm trying to raise the day, really. So that's an interesting aspect of the infrastructure that can be that can, that can be built a bit a bit more in the in the next few years, I think. And you know, we had a missed opportunity, I guess, with Corbyn and McDonald. So Corbyn and McDonald were supposedly going to take power to give it away again, and and Granby was seen as the blueprint of what they Granby Four Streets was seen as a blueprint by the, of of what the Labour government in power would would would, would do for communities across the UK. I mean, we can we can argue about whether that would be the case or not. Um, the Preston model, for instance, uh, ironically, satirically represented here with Corbyn walking up to the gates of Preston City Hall. Um, that developed independently of, of Corbyn and McDonald, but was, was supported very much by them. Um, this idea of com community wealth building. There was a community wealth building unit in the shadow cabinet while Corbyn was in power. What the likes of Matthew Brown are now doing in, in, in Preston and Claire's are doing in Preston is, is fantastic. They, they're supporting the they're supporting the um, the establishment of community land trust. They have um, community gateway association, the community owned housing society involved as one of their key anchor anchor institutions, where they will try to basically bend spending power procurement to towards um, the growth and development and incubation of, of cooperative businesses, and that might include housing co-ops. And we have the likes of, um, so Claire's as well, have been involved in um, a recent initiative in, the, in, um, in Liverpool around a land commission, which I've, which I've sat on as a commissioner. The findings will be published hopefully this month, next month, I think have been delayed by, um, by PERDA. Um, and this is Steve Rotherham at the city regional level, actually pushing in some interestingly radical directions, whether they actually, whether they actually come through um, as more than just promises, I don't know, but um, a lot of this is about supporting public common partnerships. That was some of the language they used in, in, the, in the beginning, and I've seen the recommendations and how to construct them, and we're hoping that that will be there at the end. A city regional land trust, so a land trust that actually starts to, starts to link up um, public land coming for disposal across the city region and, and work with breaking ground and, and, and Northwest Housing Services on, on pushing some of this, this forward. And, and things like an accelerator, for instance, um, which is a bit of a trendy word, right? But a kind of, some kind of incubation hub or accelerator where a lot of the knowledge and training and, and skills that have been embedded in Liverpool, in community, in these different, um, different, different initiatives, community land trust co-ops, can start to be made available to, to communities um, that are seeking similar kind of out, outcomes. And I know I've, I've overrun here, but um, the, last, the, last, the last slide is this. We may be seeing a cooperative revival coming soon, right? So um, the co-ops between them now are sitting on collective reserves of perhaps twenty-one million pounds, is what a, the back of an envelope estimate of of, of one cooperator told me recently. She, she'd done the maths, and it was like twenty-one million quid. Um, Northwest Housing Services manage most of these um, these bank accounts, these co-ops. So they have privileged access to it, and they kind of hopefully they're, they're trying to organise um, the co-ops to basically start cooperating with each other again. And make this 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 capital available um, as loan fund money, as kind of patient capital in a kind of solidarity fund, if you like, for the development of, of more of more co-ops. So again, this is this is this is about um, trying to get co-ops to cooperate again. Uh, having having lost, I think, a lot a, lo a little bit of that um, that spirit, I think, after generations have have moved on in the last few decades. But I mean, many of you will know more about this than I, so maybe we can we can have a debate about that now. Oh, there's the last slide of, of in was up and out with languages. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Oh, 
Very well. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, incredible sort of um, overviews of landscape in which that talk uh, was set, uh, but some uh, great sort of empirical details specifically and bring us into the current choices that we're facing now. Um, I'm going to actually go straight to the first question because someone has raised something which really coincided almost with your last point about reviving and getting